Yadu. May peace and blessings be upon you all. My name is Yara, and I would like to talk to, take this opportunity to talk a little bit about Loyola University Chicago Muslim Student Association and Islam Awareness Week. The MSA seeks to provide a welcoming community of faith and friendship while fostering the values of the Islamic faith. In order to serve the needs of the Loyola community, and to build an environment of mutual understanding, the MSA hosts social, educational, religious, and philanthropic events every year on campus. For me personally, the MSA has been a home away from home, and the amazing brothers and sisters on this campus that make up this wonderful community have become an extended family. Our most anticipated event of the year is the week we're culminating right now, that being Islam Awareness Week, or what we like to call IW. This year, the Muslim Student Association and over 30 other co-sponsoring organizations hosted Islam Awareness Week, a week full of interesting lectures, performances, exhibits, and delicious food, which you'll hopefully be enjoying soon, um, in the hopes of celebrating diversity, promoting mutual understanding, and fostering campus-wide friendships. Over a week of exciting activities, the MSA hoped that it would provide an insight into the world's second largest religion and the over 1.6 billion Muslims who practice it. Our MSA President Leif will be talking a little bit more about the week at the end of the week evening, but I just wanted to say, Alhamdulillah, all praise and thanks be to God. Alhamdulillah for an amazing week. Alhamdulillah for this opportunity to build campus-wide friendships and to engage our brothers and sisters of all faiths and traditions. And most importantly, Alhamdulillah for all of you. This week would not have been possible without the contribution of each and every single one of you. So many thanks to all of the wonderful people that made this week possible with your hard work and great planning over the several, several months of planning. So I just want to end by saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace and blessings be upon you all. Tonight we are blessed to have Dr. Nasha Shibri as this week's keynote speaker. Together we will be exploring, is man truly disunited with himself? A prescription for unity in our community. As a recipient of several community service and organizing honors, Dr. Nasha Shibri will elaborate on a number of community activism, social, social justice, and urban community issues. Rami Nashashibi has served as an executive director of the Inner City Muslim Action Network since its incorporation as a nonprofit in January 1997. He has a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago and has been an adjunct professor at various colleges and universities across the Chicagoland area, where he has taught a range of sociology, anthropology, and social science courses. He has worked with several leading scholars in the area of globalization, African American studies, and urban sociology. Now, Shibi has lectured across the United States, Europe, and Asia on a range of topics related to the American Muslim identity, community activism, and social justice issues, and is a recipient of several prestigious community service and organizing honors. Now, Shibi and his work with Iman have been featured on many national and international media outlets, including the BBC, PBS, and Front Page Story in the Chicago Tribune. In 2009, Chicago Public Radio selected Nashibi as one of the city's top 10 Chicago global visionaries. Nashashibi was named as one of the, as, of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. He was, named as a, he was named a White House Champion of Change in 2011 and was also invited by the governor of Illinois to serve on the Commission for the Elimination of Poverty and as a member of the Governor's Muslim Advisory Council. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Nashashibi. participating 
it's always inspiring to see uh, a mix of folks. Um, as always, you know, talking to the students beforehand uh, with a talk like this and seeing what was leading up to the week is something I like to find out about. So, here, how many of you were among the sisters from other faith traditions who fasted, uh, or not fasted, uh, who wore hijab for a whole day? Are there some of you here? Let's give it up for them. That's all. <laughs> That kind of stuff really inspires me, and I want to challenge uh, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters to think about the impact of that, and um, also to think about what it would mean to reciprocate, if you will, um, that form of radical empathy um, with communities who are on the margins. I want to start tonight by also saying I think it's a fortuitous uh, um, occasion, uh, an opportunity to talk about our subject tonight, um, which was always a, it was an interesting title for me. I, I finally deduced who's the MSA student that came up with the title for tonight's talk. Let me pick on him or her for a second. Who is that? Yara? Where's Sister Yara? Sister Yada's back there. Did you come up with this topic while reading Ralph Waldo Emerson or in a, or in a class on 19th century American transcendental thought? There you go. Okay. Because obviously, you know, the idea of man being disunited with himself is, uh, is, is something that comes out of Emerson. And I want to I'll talk about the context of that quote here in a second. But, before we get into that, I think it's important to note uh, that this obviously, as we know, April 4th, 1968, um, is a commemoration, the 46th commemoration, the assassination of perhaps one of America's most enduring, and at this point probably I still think one of the world's modern, most enduring, significant figures of Martin Luther King. And I think we should... Uh, it would be appropriate to begin reflecting on the topic, particularly of disunity and, this, and the notions of what that means when thinking about traditions of justice and traditions that challenge our communities, the fabric of our society on a, on a national, international, local level, to bring those disconnected, disrupted threads of the human family back together. What does that mean? Because the interesting thing about the quote, let me get to the actual Emerson quote, right? And Emerson, as a transcendentalist, was obviously thinking both at the time as a thinker who was challenging some of the, even the emergence of rational, logical thought, right? Which was, of course, the foundation of much of extraordinary achievement in Western uh, enlightenment. But but then there became, with him, Thoreau and early thinkers to challenge and almost caution that that advancement needs to come alongside a refinement of the human soul. And that if the human being were to continue to advance scientifically and advance in other ways about the way in which he or she sees the world without cultivating and remaining grounded in a spiritual cultivation, that ultimately there would be this disconnection. And so here, here's, the, here's the, the sentence. The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited with himself. So I like this idea of brokenness, the world in heaps, the world's broken. Our brothers and sisters from the Jewish tradition certainly understand this idea through the lens of tikkun alam, the idea of repairing a broken world. And Muslims, of course, resonate. That theme also resonates very profoundly with us. When we think about the disunited, broken world of heaps, if you will, and think for a moment on the legacy of King, we can't help but think that what continues to make King such an extraordinary visionary model and the movements that coalesced around King is that even in spite of 
extraordinary levels of criticisms at all level, King continuously and the sacrificed, even when it came to confronting very legitimate criticism with inner circles. What do I mean? You know, it's interesting. I was recently with a hip hop artist here from Chicago by the name of Mickey Halston. And um, anyone know Mickey Halston? Him and Ryan Fest, we were doing a, a remix of a track that Mickey did maybe seven years ago that was very controversial called The Liquor Store. And it was a unapologetic assault, confrontation, an artistic confrontation, if you will, on the very predacious, oppressive practices of predominantly Muslim, Arab, uh, immigrant-owned liquor stores in low-income black communities in a city like Chicago. And Mickey, uh, in that track, again, it was a pretty harsh track, Iman had been working on this issue on one capacity or the other for a number of years. More recently, over the last five years, we launched a campaign called Muslim Run, a campaign for health, wellness, and healing that was attempting to not only criticize some of the store owners, but provide a real vehicle of healing and reconciliation that would bring those store owners who wanted to turn their businesses around with the broader community. Uh, it's a campaign that I won't go much into, but I'll, I'll suggest that some of you who are interested go to the website and learn about. We're full force with and we're very excited about where it's going. But my point here is part of that campaign was a public education component where we were very adamant because he managed an organization made up of Arabs, African Americans, Latinos, and others. We're a multiracial organization. Part of our com a strategy was to go into the very communities where these stores are located and form a unique set of partnership between black churches, the store owners, and form these oversight committees and, and get these stores to begin to commit to what we have laid out as a 10-point aspirational transformation program. In other words, they signed on to this, committed for the next two years to begin to turn their stores around. And for us, it's not just about removing liquor or our pork. It's about everything from the aesthetics of the store, the dignity of the way in which people interact. But here's my point. Part of that was we reached out to Mickey because Mickey got death threats after he repeated that track, the liquor store. Look it up. Powerful video afterwards. His label, in fact, it was Mickey, Ryan Vest, Kanye West at the time were all working with one another. Clearly out of those three names, I would imagine 90% of the people in this room only probably have heard of the latter. But there's a reason for why oftentimes underground artists who don't go the full extent and, and challenge on politically social content early in their career don't make it to the way uh, someone like a Kanye did. And Mickey refused to drop that track from his album and his, and his uh, label felt it was too controversial and dropped him from the label. Now, he also got death threats after that track and so he was very sensitive about the way this was perceived in some sectors of the Muslim Arab community in, the, in you know, places like the South and West Side. We reached out to him and part of our engagement with him was to attempt to do a remix of this track that attempts after a set of conversations in which he, he was broadening, and the, the, the remix was called Bigger Than a Liquor Store. Look for it, it'll come out next year or so. Um, but it's interesting. One night, very late in the studio with Mickey, he said something about King, and I just, this is the point. He said, my grandfather always resented Martin Luther King. As, a grand, as an African American brought up on the South Side of Chicago, he resented King because many African Americans were not unlike the grandfather of Mickey, a historic South Sider who came to the South Side through the Great Migration like most African Americans, but felt that when Martin Luther King came to Chicago in the mid-60s and began marching through neighborhoods like the ones that he is working in now, Marquette Park and Gage Park, and challenging restricted covenants, redlining, essentially the policy that was keeping black folks out of those neighborhoods. 
There were many within the African American community, and some even till today, that may cite that impetus as one of the factors that disrupted what was successful in the black community. In other words, the historic moment of what sometimes sociologists talk about the black metropolis in Bronzeville, the heyday of where the black, where dollars in the black community circulated 10, 15 times because dentists and lawyers and everyone had to, by virtue of circumstance, live in a relatively uh, contiguous area like the South Side, in that particular uh, part of the South Side. So the idea that King pushed the boundaries, challenged those policies that kept black people out of those communities and then began to create an exodus out of those communities for the black middle class, there's some who will say that that actually hurt the black community more than it helped the black community. So it was interesting for me to hear that perspective. Now, why am I raising that? I'm raising that because in the context of that conversation, that critique would be even more cogent if King had at his core only the interest of some sector of the black community in mind. But King's vision was always greater was always larger. And in many ways, King was about the healing and the reconciliation of the nation, particularly at that time. Challenging to say that an America that continues to have its major urban metropolitan areas, like Chicago, like Detroit, existing the way it looked like in the 1960s and even in the 1970s, doesn't have a moral leg to stand on. And all of us that live in America are affected by that disparity, that disconnectedness, that inability for America to live up to some of its loftier aspirations. So the extraordinary contribution that King made wasn't just for one group of people. It was to challenge the larger nation, even though some within the black community, and we certainly understand some of that criticism, we understand some of the criticism of the SNCC leaders, of some of the more black nationalists at the time, who suggested that King and some of the civil rights leaders were as attuned to the utter needs and the priorities of the black community, because in part that critique was true. He then later in life received another round of criticism when he started right particularly in the last year of his life, and we, most of you, if you have not read the speech he gives on April 4th, 1967, because Increasingly, I think over the last 10, 15 years, students are being more exposed to that. But for a long time, we celebrate the I Have a Dream. We celebrate, we don't often celebrate where King was in the last year of his life. The famous Morning Heights church, uh, uh, church speech beyond Vietnam. The speech where he begins after, by the way, being applauded by the president, brought to the White House, given a Nobel Peace Prize, given perhaps the most extraordinary platform any civil rights leader has ever been given, he begins to then come out vocally and make connections between the kids in the rice fields of Vietnam and the kids on the south side of Chicago. And you can imagine the criticism. There were certainly others within the African American community that said, it's not that we don't care about the kids in the rice fields in Vietnam. It's not that we don't care about the suffering of others. But are you ready to sacrifice all the achievement that we have as a collective movement made to get this far by coming out vocally against the government in such an extraordinary way and in the government policy? And we know the very same people who were then bringing him into the White House caught on record 
through the release of the COINTELPRO papers, begin to refer to him as a N preacher during this end moment. And King's response to that critique, that critique that, what are you doing? You're about to sacrifice. You're about to lose all the accomplishments we've made. His famous response, I have fought too long against segregation and pub segregation in the public accommodations and in all spheres of life to end up segregating my moral concerns. King's vision went even beyond reconciliation with the new nation. It was a vision of global reconciliation. And so the premise of tonight's talk certainly is presumptuous, and I don't want to in any way, shape, or form pretend like I have the answers of thinking about how to repair a disrepaired, disrupted, and disconnected world. But I would suggest, both in my limited experience as an organizer and from my basic understanding of the spiritual traditions that so many of us in this room, whether in Islam, Christianity, or Judaism, or the other traditions, adhere to, that the idea of challenging ourselves to think about the reconciliation of humanity, the idea of understanding the brokenness, first and foremost, means being able to point to what is broken. In order to fix what is broken, you need to first and foremost identify what is broken. And we need to recognize, right, that oftentimes we may not always be looking at what is broken from the same perspective. And in today's day and age, the, one of the most extraordinary challenges is there is lots of social, political, economic, cultural forces at work to cover up what is broken. And so it takes extraordinary effort to oftentimes reveal that the type of disparities that may characterize a city like Chicago or the global disparity, that that is nothing that we should be comfortable with. And we need to find practical ways, practical solutions in each of these areas. But the end vision, again, for King was reconciliation. He said the end is no matter, even in the midst of some of his most ferocious protests, when people were being hosed down, when dogs were being set on people, and, and when he was confronting jail time, he would always say, look, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of a beloved community. And King, his beloved community concept was not some utopian vision, but was really something as within the context of an organizing reality that we, if we can get enough sectors of our communities to begin to align on common interests, we can begin to create a world that is more reflective of our collective ideals. He fundamentally believed in the practicality of that. Muslims certainly can relate to that in very profound ways because I think one reading of our tradition is that our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and for our brothers and sisters outside the Muslim tradition, this is some aspect of the life of the Prophet Muhammad that I would challenge you to get to know. That at the core, we always, and I often bring this up, and we talk about this in the context of our organizing work. Sometimes there's, in our tradition, we refer to the sunnah, and sometimes the sunnah becomes a basis for debates and conversations, and people, you know, measuring beards or pant legs, or people getting into ideological, theological debates with one another. The reality that I think sometimes gets lost on Muslims is that before even a word of revelation came to the Prophet Muhammad, he had a maqam in society. He had a standing. He had a status. And we read about it all the time. You may hear about it. Al-Amin, as-Sadiq, the truthful one, the trustworthy one. 
The amazing thing for us is that he did not acquire that status by simply meditating on otherworldly matters in a cave. We all, and some of you may have heard me reflect on this moment in the life of the Prophet Muhammad because I think it's such, for the organizers, it's such a definitive moment. When the Prophet comes running down from the mountain after receiving this extraordinary interaction with the Divine, through the angel Gabriel. He runs, again, doesn't run into the arms of his homies, doesn't run into the you know, arms of the strongest dude in the village, right? He runs into the arms of a woman. And for some of the gender stereotypes that still get associated with Islam, this strong, misogynistic patriarchy, right? That sometimes gets so erroneously attributed to the time of the Prophet and to the Prophet himself, if there's any moment among so many other moments that totally flip that paradigm on the head, it's this one such moment where here it is. It's not one of those Humphrey Bogart moments in kind of early 20th century American film where, you know, the, the leading man is having to slap a woman into his senses, right? Madman's coming back on TV if anyone wants a whiff of that era, right? But in fact, it was what? It was in this case, Khadija, his boss, 15 years his senior, the woman that selected him for marriage, who then has, he runs to her, cover me, protect me. Shivering, literally shivering in the arms of a woman. Here is this extraordinarily strong prophetic figure, shivering in the arms of a woman who then brings him to his senses by assuring him that he's not gone astray, that he's not gone insane, that this was not a demonic you know, representation. And, and here's the point. She begins to use evidence in his own life to assure him that what he just experienced, this extraordinary encounter with the divine, is what, is, is what it said it was. What does she use? She says, you were among the people who did what? You took care of the masakin, the poor, the, 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 the fukara. You did eslah bin nas. You brought people together. This was a prophetic quality of the Prophet Muhammad even before he received revelation and was one of the things that Khadija in her wisdom عنها, used to assure him that he is in line with those prophetic traditions before him. This idea of bringing the broken, disrupted human family back together is a core prophetic trait that you see right in the heart of, of, of the Prophet's tradition. And throughout his life, early, what is so radical about his message in early 7th century Arabia is that he begins to reconfigure a human family that has been disrupted by notions of patriarchy, notions that subjected women to less than human status. A challenge that still is with us in the 21st century in so many parts of the world, including those who claim to be Muslim. Of course, Muslims are familiar with among some of the most barbaric, repulsive practices was the burial of, of, of young girls. But among those, so he begins to reassemble a community that has been fractured by this type of misogynistic, violent patriarchy. He begins to reassemble a community that was still subjected by tribal affiliations and slavery that subjected people like Bilal al-Habishi, Suhaim al-Rubi, Salman al-Farsi, all these various individuals who were on the margins of the Meccan society in 7th century Arabia, the Prophet begins to create a foundation upon which they are coming together in a way that not only modeled a sense of what Islam looked like and was going to look like for hundreds of years afterwards, but the idea that the human family that was fractured, right? The idea that an Ethiopian slave can be your brother and in fact your leader, not a slave. 
The fact that a Roman slave can meet the, all the same rights as a tribal uh, cousin was unheard of in 7th century Arabia. The idea that now you're going to begin to reconfigure the bonds upon which you connect to humanity, right? This reconciliation of the human family. Now, we as Muslims, particularly those in, in academic settings, you know, we can't paint pictures that also don't reflect that our communities, any single one of them, have not struggled historically and, contemporary, and in contemporary settings with these ideas. And even during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, you see examples of people struggling with these ideals. A very famous incident happens in the procession of a Jewish funeral, where he's sitting with companions and a Jewish funeral procession comes by. And out of respect, the Prophet Muhammad stands up and some of the recently converted companions looked at him and say, Yahudiyan, Ya Rasulullah, that, that was a Jew, a prophet of God. Maybe you thought it was a Muslim funeral. And his response, Alaysa Nafsa, was that not the container of the human soul? Was that not a human being? Stand up. So again, a reminder that even the religious barriers that certainly were not ideal even in 7th century Arabia and even during and after the time of the Prophet, there were struggles, but the vision, the ideal, that even the barriers that begin, that we begin to erect between religious communities, right, that begin to dehumanize one another on some notion, false notion of piety, or on some perceived wrong, on some perceived wrong. And you know, as a Palestinian, and as a family uh, who's direct, I can call my aunt right now who lives in a, uh, in a rubble of the home that my father lived in and his father lived in and his father's father lived in till the time of Salah al-Din Ayubi in Jerusalem, who lived in a rubble who cannot repair a crumbling bathroom for fear of the fact that it may be demolished. So I understand the oppressive practices, but I also know that as we speak, there are Jewish Israelis who are serving time in prison, refusing to go into Gaza in the IDF. I also know that as we speak, there are probably sometimes more courageous stands that Jewish Americans have made across this country on behalf of Muslims than even sometimes those within the Muslim community. And I even know that as we speak, that as empathetic and sympathetic as some sectors of the Jewish community may be with the plight of Palestinians, they still fear that in the language of BDS, or in the language of our emphatic stance, that they hear a string of what sound is like early 19th century anti-Semitism. And you may want to dismiss that and say that's not true, but we need to be empathetic. We need to be empathetic. And I would suggest that the Prophet ﷺ, his stance was the ability to begin to identify with suffering where it is. And even when you're speaking truth to power, begin to speak with the voice of moral authority. And I would suggest that those types of issues, and I went ahead and identified the 100 pound gorilla in the room because I know it's one thing to talk about, you know, interfaith activities and conversations, but we need to identify the issues of our time that separate our communities and begin to find ways of challenging one another to live up to more loftier ideals. And if we're going to challenge one community to challenge its own oppression, we need to be equally ready to challenge all our forms of internal oppression here across the world. And oftentimes, if we're honest, that's not always the case. Our communities are very vocal and emphatic about certain things that we may be passionate about, but may look at another issue and may even say it's not my issue. When I talk to some of the Palestinians, for instance, about the state of kind of what's happening on the south and west side of Chicago, occasionally they may look at me and say, well, that we, we're, we're, we hope that you're working there and we know that you're working there. We know even at one time there was a strong Palestinian community there, but that may not be our issue anymore. But when I say that 
still 80% of the businesses that are owned in this particular area are actually owned by Palestinian Americans, and that most of your and that a lot of their economic survival still subsists after these conditions. We cannot disconnect ourselves from these realities, these stories. We can't disconnect ourselves from the terminology that is still used to refer to African Americans, blacks in even some of the Arabic language. The notion that an Abid was once Abdullah that begins to be deployed in a, a very pejorative way when talked about Af We need to be honest about these issues. We need to be honest that we can walk into a masjid and hear language that is completely antithetical to our tradition. And we need to be open. We, this, is, this is not the era that we have backroom conversations just among ourselves. You know, mashallah, the NSA is reading all your texts, right? It's that moment. It's 2014 in America. It's open, right? So let's have open, let's use that opportunity to have really open, frank dialogue. Not one conversation in these kind of uh, more theoretically safe interface settings and then we go back home and there's another conversation. Let's be consistent about what we bring to the tables. I would say, as we think about this tradition of healing a broken world and bringing the threads together, we think about not only, you know, Martin Luther King gets deployed in moments, and, I, and I'd like to raise this other individual as a person that I think oftentimes doesn't get celebrated as much. And I think the, the, per, the idea of celebrating examples is not to get into, you know, uh, the often deluded and, and sometimes not so helpful uh, personality worship of one individual. Someone like a king, of course, is the culmination of all the movements behind it. But I want to also lift up a person like um, Imam Muaddi Muhammad Rahimahullah. Because I think Muslims need to celebrate examples and our brothers and sisters in other faith traditions need to also see examples. We hear about Malcolm and Malcolm had an extraordinary role in agitating America to live up to these ideals. But then not too many people in this room, if I were to ask, who is Imam Mu'addi Muhammad? How many in this room feel confident that they can talk about who he is, honestly? So, and, and, that's, and that in an MSA week is, is and for me, honestly, for our Muslims, we have to be, you know, we have to begin to claim and celebrate these types of personalities. Imam Mu'addi Muhammad, the late son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, remember, he inherits a movement and Imam Muhammad is probably in the 20th century and probably the person, and I'm the Matic Ryan with my fellow, my colleague here uh, that I've worked with and lived with in many capacities. You can challenge me on this later. But I would contend, from my limited reading of history, that Imam Muhammad precipitates the largest migration to Sunni or universal Islam than any other person of one community in the late 20th century. Certainly in America. Certainly in America. Because all of a sudden, in 1975, remember, those of you who studied the history of Muhammad Ali or the Nation of Islam, it, uh, 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 remember, alongside the history of the Civil Rights Movement, you have another movement that's coming up. And Muslims, we should never dis not even understand the significance of that movement. That's part of our history. The Nation of Islam is part of our history. And, and my brothers and sisters in the Jewish and white communities, you should understand me as a Muslim, as much as I continue, well, I will never apologize for that history, as much as I may differ from some of it, because part of it is part of American history. You know, sometimes the nation gets credited with just talking about blue-eyed devils and all, but really what the nation was doing in the early 20th century had less to do with Islam and more about inverting the logic of white supremacy. Now, you know, when we begin to celebrate films like 12 Years a Slave, and you see Oprah Winfrey making a movie about uh, the, the butler, was it about the butler? And the interesting thing, I saw the opening of the butler, and I did see the 12 Years a Slave. 19, you know, these histories are still with us. These histories are still with us. You can still talk to people who have grandfathers that were born in post-construction America. 
And what you notice in those two films, if you juxtapose them together, that 1840s or 1850s Georgia didn't look much different on a cotton field than it looked like in 1930. In 1930, in 1939, in 1945. Those are relevant histories. And the nation of Islam came out of that history. It came out of cotton fielders that were coming straight from the south into urban settings like Chicago, Detroit. What did they do? They took on a very black nationalist understanding and interpretation of Islam that inverted white supremacy. That's really, in many ways, what it was attempting to do. You call us children and devils, you, in fact, are the devils. You don't want us in your religious institutions, we won't have you in your religious institutions. You want to step, you want to project yourself as the quintessence of human creation, as godlike, as the supreme biological evolution of, of humanity. We're going to flip the paradigm and say we were the original Asiatic gods. If, you, if anyone is familiar with that discourse, in many ways, that's all it was doing. So as Americans, we need to understand that's just part of our history. But here's why I'm saying about Imam Muhammad. Imam Muhammad inherited that. He grew up in that. And in 1975, he stood in front of a mega crowd on the south side of Chicago. And after his father died, taking the reins, with Louis Farrakhan right behind him, beginning to usher in a new era, suggesting that the very same people who have harbored these thoughts are now going to become part of a global community, a global religious community that begins to reconcile their sense of national racial identity with a broader spiritual identity. And that message was so radical and profound that in fact, Louis Farrakhan and others within the nation said that many of the nation weren't ready for it. And he broke from the nation. And you see the split. And he takes people to Hajj for the first time. The large sector of the African American Muslim for the first time go to Hajj. He begins to lead them in eat prayers. And he begins to take African American Muslims to the Vatican to meet the Pope. Right? Reconciliation. I mean, this type of profound spiritual human reconciliation. We have it in our communities. We've seen it with extraordinary movements. And I would suggest it's important that we lift up those examples as we look at the daunting task before us and to take this seriously. In closing, I want to suggest that this idea of healing a broken world, the idea of reconciling a, 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 a family, a, a human family in a city like Chicago in the context of the global age that we live in does require people who are passionately committed and invested in the idea that somehow their spirituality is not fully aligned with the creator in a way to produce the type of peace that Islam invites people to attempt to submit to and certainly other traditions certainly speak about unless they fundamentally deal with these issues. The idea the, we all heard the prophetic tradition that a person that goes to sleep with their neighbor hungry, right? The question is, who's our neighbor? And the Prophet Muhammad actually talked about the neighbor so much that he used to say that the angel Gabriel came to me so much about rights of the neighbor, I was going to think that the neighbor was going to get rights of inheritance. And there was never any question about whether the neighbor was Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, or any other religious identification. That this is actually at the core of the tradition. And I would suggest that this kind of search for the stranger, the attention to those who are on the margins, exists in other traditions as well. But see, what we do in our modern age is that we conveniently gate our neighbors out. Our, begin, our neighbors begin to look almost, we begin to become very provincial about the definition of who's our neighbors. That one person on the block at the very end of the block, is it the person in the same city? And in an age where poverty, extreme poverty and extreme wealth is often, there used to be a moment in a city like Chicago where you had the Gold Coast and the slum phenomenon. At least people on the Gold Coast, a stumbles away was the slum. You saw it every day. And you were reminded about a juxtaposing reality. Increasingly, whether you're in Karachi, whether you're in Amman, whether you're in Chicago, the growing global disparity and trend is to remove us from the inconvenience of having to confront 
the types of disparities on a daily basis, or we find coping mechanisms to deal with it. And I would suggest that the spiritual traditions that invite us to attempt to think about that as an issue is disruptive, it is uncomfortable, it is essentially a state of agitation. And here's the paradox, that living in that type of agitation is perhaps, I think, in many ways, the way in which our tradition suggests one attains a higher state of connection and peace with God and peace with the rest of humanity. When you embrace and search out that type of agitational relationship and understand that I, in other words, seeking not to become comfortably acculturated to the very uncomfortable disparities is an act of righteous intervention, I think that many of our traditions call us to. And certainly, I think there is enough within the tradition of Islam I would close by saying that that calls us to that and I would close by both inviting my Muslim brothers and sisters to begin to hold up that tradition more here in America and here across the world. I would invite my brothers and sisters who are not Muslim here to can embrace that part of the Muslim tradition as part of what a, a Muslims have to contribute that's good in the world. Just like I as a Muslim who lives on the south side can be in spite of any challenge the Catholic Church has ever had. There it is undisputable that you can see the extraordinary force for good that the Catholic Church has had in a city like Chicago. From schools, to hospitals, to orders of sisters who have devoted, in where I live, there's the Sisters of Casimir who have been there for over a century. We're out there with King. We're out there with Rabbi Marx who've endured extraordinary hardship, but have remained committed. And certainly you see that in Jewish institutions across the country. And I think Muslims, it's time that Muslims and Islam in America and across the world begin to see for the force of social good and transformation that it has been and that it is for millions of people across the world. But in order for that to happen, Muslims need to accentuate that aspect of our tradition we need to be ready to pre be prepared to have that honest set of conversations. And our non-Muslim brothers and sisters need to be ready to embrace and celebrate and hold that aspect of our tradition up as well. And God willing, collectively, we can continue to work towards a vision of the beloved community that is anchored in all of our traditions, both in the city like Chicago and across the world. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.